Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to IQ 32. This is episode 32 already. I can't believe it. I have um, a return guest today. I want you to meet again, Dr. Seth Hawkins. Now, I had him as a guest last year at ASEP, and he did a fantastic, phenomenal job. So that's why I'm asking him to come back. Now, it is August right now, and so right in the middle of this wonderful, wonderful summer, um, we love but also some other creatures in this world love too, and they're out there. And that's why I've asked Dr. Hawkins to come back. Now, Dr. Hawkins, would you introduce yourself? Hey there, it's Seth Collins Hawkins here, uh, emergency physician and iCube fan. Oh, very good, thank you. Well, he's being awfully modest. Did you know, Dr. Hawkins, you have a Wikipedia page? Oh no. (laughs) Oh dear. So you have an entire Wikipedia page. I am uh, honored to have you as my guest today. So I picked this case for you. So uh, this is back in April. It's just the beginning of the warm weather around here. And I was working and a 62 year old female with a history of hypertension and hypothyroidism comes in with a snake bite, okay? She said she was walking with her husband on their um, pretty sprawling property actually and she was bitten by a rattlesnake on the left medial ankle and it happened just about 20 minutes before she came in it was about 10 o'clock in the morning so the husband said that he killed the snake uh he was really absolutely sure that it was rattlesnake um did not bring it in (laughs) uh she applied an over-the-counter suction device on the bite and then she came into the er right away uh she comes in and she's in some pain did not look like she was in a lot of distress though Um, The husband said that he killed many rattlesnakes on their property over the past 10 plus years. So then, uh, so on physical examination, she's a well-developed, well-nourished female and she's conversant, no distress really, but she was uncomfortable, you can tell. Um, Her vitals are right here. Uh, Blood pressure is 194 over 90. Uh, Pulse is is 91, respiration is at 14 and saturate 96% on room air. So this is what you see. It's 1022. And you can see one fang mark. The indentation, the circular indentation, is the suction device. <laughs> when I took the suction device off, that's what left the uh, indentation. That wasn't from the snake. <laughs> so, you know, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, this is a really good example of the um, first aid and rescue world uh, progressing with very little physician or scientific input. Right. So. Um, the, the original version of these was the Sawyer extractor kit, and there's okay. a couple that are available. Uh, and these are, um, these are discredited now in the wilderness medicine world and uh, academic emergency medicine right. Right. based on the lack of evidence for them to be helpful. So, so then at this point, you know, um, I first thing I thought of, because I believe the husband, the first thing I thought of, well, if it's a rattlesnake bite, I'm going to need to have some help, which is poison control. <laughs> and um, we have our local uh, Arizona poison control, and I love using them uh, frequently. But there, I didn't realize this. I didn't know if you know, Seth, there's, a, there's a, like a national phone number, 1-800-222-1222. You can call anywhere in the country and you can get poison control. They wanted me to get platelets, the fibrinogen, and coags. That's pretty much um, um, standard, actually, for a rattlesnake bite. So we got some um, data back. As you can see, <laughs> the CBC, the uh, coags all look really quite normal. Um, I'll just show you the rest of the ED course. What I call tox, tox, talk to the tox fellow. And um, I, at that time, I really felt... Um, we need to observe her rather than immediately treat her because there's always, um, you know, it's always a risk and benefit evaluation whenever you consider um, administering something as powerful as an anti-venom. So uh, this is when she first came in and then I wanted to show you the progression because I took pictures about every half hour, an hour or so. So you see the, the photo on the left, um, is at 10.52, and the mark marker was just marking the border of the edema. And then the photo on the right, the, uh, the second mark there is just the advancement or progression of the edema up the ankle a little bit. And then, um, as you see, 12.40, so two hours and 40 minutes or so after. And then uh, 
the photo on the right is um, three and a half hours after, and then that extra line there up the ankle is again kind of the border of the edema. Um, and at this point, I still was in discussion with the toxicologist, was in discussion with the patient, trying to make a collaborative decision about uh, treatment for her. And she was having pain, but not excruciating, and she didn't have any systemic symptoms whatsoever. Then just about the time my shift was end ending, um, it's a 310, this is you know five hours or so after the bite, and um, didn't really progress a lot more than that. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, there's all sorts of interesting things here, isn't it? I love that you're involving lots of stakeholders in the decision making. Right. So, you know, these are very, like, not only are there, the, the, the side effect profile is pretty good now based on allergies and things like that with the newer antivenom, but right. um, they're super expensive. Like, this is a very um, high cost intervention. So I think yes. uh, involving the family, involving the patient, and then also toxicologists and um, poison control centers are interesting. I think they've ver they really vary in the quality of information they uh, uh, provide. And, and I'd be interested to know what you think about your, your interface with them, but certainly local toxicologists in a place like Arizona um, should be very, very well equipped to deal with this as should an emergency physician coming out of a, out of a residence. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yes. Oh no. I've, Really, I think Arizona Poison Control uh, is wonderful. It's really a great, great resource for us because um, they're always, um, well, first of all, there's a fellowship there. Um, and so there's, they're very accessible. And so I've, I've called hundreds of times through my career here in Arizona. And so I consulted the talks fellow right from the beginning. We texted, uh, I texted him photos um, and keeping, kept him updated. The swelling of the ankle um, slowly increased over that first six hours, five to six hours that I was with her, and absolutely no systemic symptoms whatsoever, which was really a good thing. Um, she did need a couple doses of fentanyl because of the pain, and the pain had uh, kind of increased while she was here. She was there with me, and really we had decided not to administer the anti-venom uh, at the top by the time I left so I, I passed my patient along to my my partner when he came on and explained uh, sort of the whole approach and the whole attitude we we had I had apparently uh, the pain was pretty persistent they repeated D-dimer and it was up a little bit so my partner called and talked to the tox fellow that I had been uh, in touch with they decided together to go ahead and administer six vials of the croak fab we had at the time in the hospital and then transferred her over to uh, Phoenix, uh, Banner, Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix. And then she was discharged actually fine the next day. I talked to the toxicologist. There was no more croak fab given. He said that the swelling really did not advance any more than the last photo I had sent him. So he, she did very well. She did very well. <laughs> So, as you know, I have two learning focuses, and the first one will be, ta-da, on rattlesnake envenomations. <laughs> Self-explanatory. Um, so, this is a little video I thought it be, we should take a look at. It's kind of fun. Hello, folks. My name is Keith Bosen, director of the Arizona Poison and Drug Information Center, and we got something to share with you. Last week, we had the opportunity to go out into the desert and film a live rattlesnake striking a foot. So, what you are seeing here is a Mojave rattlesnake striking a foot. Rattlesnakes are some of the fastest striking snakes in the world, and one of the only venomous creatures in the world that will warn you before striking. When a rattlesnake strikes, they will open their mouth wide open and their fangs, which normally sit flat against the roof of their mouth, will come out pointed straight at the object they're striking towards. While this video depicts a rattlesnake rattling before striking, not all rattlesnakes need to rattle before they strike. Remember, this is a defensive posture for them, and if they don't have time to rattle, they will protect themselves with everything they have and the most powerful weapon they have is their venom. That was pretty cool. I uh, read, I, I found this, this article on uh, MCRIT 
Fox and Hound. So this is a bit of a rattlesnake uh, primer. Um, in the U.S., about 5,000 snake bites are annually reported through the American Association of Poison Control Centers. Um, the most medically important venomous snakes are the rattlesnakes, which are in all states in the United States, Ugh, scary, <laughs> except where Alaska, Hawaii, and Maine. Copperheads, uh, which are in your side of the country, <laughs> Eastern USA, Massachusetts, or Texas, and then cottonmouths or water moccasins, which are also on the eastern, eastern side of southeastern US, Virginia, and Texas. And all three of these uh, snakes belong to the Cotalinae genus of snakes. So how do you identify a rattlesnake? Well, um, they have triangular shaped heads. They have uh, vertically oriented elliptical pupils and they have front mobile fangs. They have pit-like depressions behind the nostrils. I don't want to be that close to be able to see those. <laughs> to be able to tell. But anyway, and then uh, I definitely don't want to be this close to see a single row of the scales on the undersurface of the snake. Um, the venom for the rattlesnake, well, they're consist the venom consists of very powerful enzymes and proteins carbon the lipids. The most important and uh, obvious uh, clinical effects of rattlesnake bites are uh, thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy, and then very severe local tissue damage can occur. So I'm talking to you, Dr. Hawkins, and I say, I got bitten by a rattlesnake. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Um, so very, very few of the... Uh -huh interventions that people think of or that yeah. are recommended yeah. that um, you read about uh, are helpful. And in fact, right. the, the most important thing, if there is going to be a bad outcome or morbidity or even mortality from this bite is rapid access to antivenin, which sometimes is fairly delayed because it's very rarely, if ever, available in the field. Right. So what, what, what this essentially means is rapidly getting to a medical center that would be careful capable of administering antivenin. Right, exactly. So get yourself to the ER is what I would say, right? But what do I do right now at this moment? <laughs> Any word, <Okay>. Dr. Hawkins? <laughs> the, famous, uh, the famous things, um, the famous list uh, on that topic is what not to do. So we know right. that uh, tourniquets are not appropriate. We know that cutting and sucking, which is pretty infamously um, known about this particular injury pattern is not appropriate. You get another wound either at or nearby <laughs> right. you already have um, that can get contaminated. Um, ice is not appropriate because of its interaction with the uh, venom from the snake itself. Right. There was a Lancet article, I believe, um, in the remote past or something in the British literature suggesting um, that uh, electrical shock would be helpful to um, reduce the effect of the venom. And there've actually been some cases of people getting electrocuted from car batteries and other <laughs> things who have read that medical publication translated out into the popular literature is try to shock it. Uh, there's a long list of things not to do. One of the most common questions, because you have to hold it somewhere, is how do you position it? And you were talking about that as far as elevation or, or putting it dependent. Um, there's sort of arguments on, on both sides. I think nobody can really particularly argue with keeping an extremity at heart level, which is kind right. of the, the neutral answer. Exactly. Um, we do know for an adult that it's very, very rare to die from these uh, bites. And you were talking about the complexities of the venom and Sometimes, actually, there's as much risk for anaphylaxis as there is to the venom itself. Um, so it's actually pretty rare to die directly from the venom exactly. if you are um, an adult that's not immunocompromised and not elderly. So a normally aged, normally sized, non-immunocompromised adult would rarely um, have a fatal systemic reaction to it. Right. Right. So one of the dangers of, of holding it dependent because you want to prevent movement to the heart and then um, sort of transmission throughout the body um, is that we're actually seeing more instances where there's uh, local necrotic damage and even oh. amputations uh, from people who have forced it into one, like into hand, say, or in this case in the foot. Right. Right. If you were to keep the foot way dependent, you force all that venom down right. into the foot and you avoid the ability to use the biomass of the body to distribute it in a way that's rarely 
fatal. Now that might not be the case for young kids or for the immunocompromised or for the elderly. Um, but similarly, it's not totally clear that like holding it in an elevated position and trying to distribute it through the body is necessarily the best plan. So, so probably somewhere in the spectrum of holding it at heart level or slightly above is the way to go. And a lot of that is affected by how you're getting to the emergency department. Like if you're, <laughs> it depends on how, how long you'll be. Right. So this is the Arizona poison control website uh, page on, on the rattlesnakes and it exactly, you were exactly right. Um, the advice is don't use ice or electricity. Don't use constricting bands. Don't give alcohol or medication to the patient. Don't wait to see if you get any symptoms. Don't catch the snake. The, the husband of my patient actually killed her. He was very confident. Um, so, uh, but uh, do try to relax and move as little as possible and uh, remove any tight clothing, shoes, or jewelry from the uh, limb that was bitten and then go directly to the nearest medical um, facility, which is what we were advocating. So then up to 25% of pit viper bites are dry bites, um, meaning no venom. True envenomations are either uh, evidenced by hemotoxicity on the labs or on the physical exam. Uh, such as pain, tenderness, and swelling, or if it's a very subtle kind of uh, uh, physical finding, you can uh, palpate the lymph nodes in that to, to that limb or that area, and it, the lymph node can be tender. And I did not know that. I read that. Um, control the pain with fentanyl um, rather than morphine. Uh, morphine can give a histamine release, so that's the reason not to do that. That can be confusing if there is histamine release. Um, it's really crucial to immobilize the extremity and elevate the extremity. Update your tetanus, tetanus, and then, as you said, really the key treatment is to get the patient to uh, the antivenom as soon as possible. So pitfalls and pointers. Um, snake bites very rarely get infected, so there's really no need for prophylactic antibiotics. The uh, rattlesnake, bite, rattlesnake bites uh, rarely actually result in compartment syndrome, even though the limb can be extremely, extremely swollen. I had a patient that many years ago who reached around um, the back of a cabinet in a in storage shed and got bitten in the hand. And by the time he came in, which was very quickly, he, his entire arm, forearm was just, just gigantic, actually, and um, uh, bruised, and it really felt firm as it would in a compartment syndrome. But the recommendation is that you don't do, do anything unless you really can prove that car, the part, compartment uh, pressure is extremely high. But apparently it's very rare to have true compartment syndrome. Um, blood products are not typically indicated after rattlesnake envenomation. And um, if you do have thrombocytopenia and coagulopathy, you don't give products, blood products. The anti-venom is first line for treat, treatment of those hematologic uh, uh, problems. <music> Learning focus number two. Any idea? Seth? Why we like snakes. <laughs> they're not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. But no, we'll talk briefly about rattlesnake anti-venom, okay? Um, I did learn a bunch about antivenom when I did this research for this uh, episode. So um, my, for my source uh, on this learning focus, uh, it's uptodate.com. The article is uh, Evaluation and Management of Crotalinae or um, Rattlesnakes or Water Moccasin or Copperhead Bites in the United States. So Rattlesnake Antivenom. So we've had Crofab all these many, many years. Um, Crofab is a uh, sheep-derived or ovine antivenom. Um, what it is is purified fab fragment raised against the venom of three rattlesnake species and one water moc moccasin species. The side effects are very rare, including allergic reaction or serum sickness. Um, four to six bowls, uh, four to six vial bolus to start with. Um, and then repeat frequently until the progression of the edema has halted and the hematologic abnormalities have resolved. Now, there's a new kid on the block. Have you heard of this one, Anavip? Yes, I just heard about it recently. Re really new. Yeah, but exactly. So Anavip is an equine or horse-derived antivenom, fab fragment, and it was introduced in October of 2018. Uh, and purportedly, is with this, from the studies, uh, there's less delayed coagulopathy uh, or uh, hypersensitivity reaction due to the longer half-life it has. And the initial starting dose is 
10 vials. So, well, Seth, thank you so much for joining me today. I figured a wilderness expert would be great uh, to discuss with uh, about this patient. Yes, I, I appreciate it. And, and uh, let me say that there's a movement towards getting um, venomologists more involved in these consultations. And I think it, it, uh, I would be remiss not to point that out. Um, the author of the uh, Animal Envenomation and Bite chapter in our Wilderness EMS textbook, whose name is Ben Abo, has been a big leader oh. in this kind of movement. Great. So there's now the capability for clinical consultations involving snake bites to actually access national and international venomologists uh, as well as toxicologists, which is meaning to say it's a subspecialty of um, emerging emergency medicine and, uh, and toxicology. How do we so get in touch with them? There's a snakebitefoundation.org is their website. Um, and you can reach uh, any of them. There's four of them um, from across the world who are wow. snake bite experts. But then specifically in the United States, there's a Venom 1 and a Venom 2 team based in Florida. Huh. And they will um, deliver uh, anti-venoms to hospitals that don't have them by helicopter. Wow. Um, and they will also um, take consultation. So I think that's, that's one of the most direct ways to, um, to kind of immediately access uh, people like Dr. Abo who take actual consultations specifically on snake bites. And Have you had personally dealt with uh, snake bites where you are, a patient? Yes, yeah, so we've had um, rattlesnake bites just like you're describing. Uh, and then I actually took care of a cobra bite oh in, um, when I was in Bhutan that was just a great example of just what we're saying about re releasing clothing because I saw this patient in the ED a day after they had arrived. They had come in from a remote hospital, which in Bhutan can be a day's travel. And they, they had a, essentially their shirt had become a tourniquet on the arm. So they had cut off supply to their arm <gasps> simply because nobody had cut the shirt free. But this is not to knock anybody. No, you know, no, I understand. I understand. Or, the, or the care that was delivered there. It's a really common problem in the States as well. In the era of CT scanners and x-ray machines, really the critical importance of physical exam. So everybody was focused on this hand bite, you know, which was on the hand and his, his uh, shirt was constricting um, the, the, uh, the arm much closer to the shoulder. Yeah, a couple cases that I've seen that really emphasize, all, all of them have emphasized exactly what you were uh, presenting in this podcast. One of the common questions is whether you can walk out in the situation you need to be carried out. And again, it's a little bit circumstantial, but since we're not as worried about circulating venom to the body as we used to be, right? really there's not a strong argument for these people not, not walking slowly and carefully. I just have them walk out, not have to carry them. Well, thank you, Seth, so much for joining me. You've been a wonderful uh, guest, just like you were last year. So thanks, everybody, for watching this month. I really appreciate everybody's support, and this is uh, my labor of love. I hope to see you guys at a conference this year, and I hope you have a, re a great rest of the year. Bye. See you later. Thank Bye, you so much. Seth. Take care. Uh, take care.